All right, well, I am in Melbourne, Australia today. I am lucky enough to be joined by Gil DeVere from our FASI group. So welcome on the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and, you know, appreciate you coming all the way to Melbourne. Yeah. And we brought the weather for you as well. I know, I turned up, didn't bring a jacket and then was hammered by the rain when I first got here. Sorry, sorry about that. So maybe just for the audience to start off with, I think a lot of people in Australia probably know who Alfazi is just by the sheer size, but overseas, some companies might not. So before we get into the company, we'll get you to introduce yourself and sure. then just talk about who Alfazi is. Sure. So, I mean, I, um, be, I'm the MD of Alfazi Group. So an Alfazi Group uh, consists of um, construction, property and, and uh, hire. Um, but myself, I've been, um, you know, I, I'm an engineer by trade did that at uni and then um, went to work for Alfasi um, as a project engineer straight out of uni. I probably had some help with my now wife who was Avri Alfasi's daughter at the time. So she probably um, helped me get a job, sure. which was nice. And um, yeah, so I, and I've been working with Alfasi ever since. Um, made my way up the ranks and... Um, um, you know, I'm a father of four daughters, so I'm surrounded by women. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got I've got a dog and two cats, which are also female. So okay. it's a, just a full female just house. A dominance, yeah. Dominance. That's funny. Um, but yeah. And so, so you said that you were brought into the business. So what was your first role? You said you were an engineer. Yeah, right? yeah. I was a project engineer. Um, I my first actually my first project was the Dockland Stadium. Which was um, which is now called Marvel Stadium in in the Docklands in Melbourne. So we were the steel contractor that did the all the steel. So the the you know the roof and the, the retractable roof and you know at the time it was the biggest stadium of its type. So it was a huge job for us. Um, it really put us on the map in steel constructions. But that was my first job. I was on site every day, seven o'clock, roll up the sleeves, walk around, you know, check that everything's right, do all the engineering and procurement and that's how I started and uh, you know then that led to me um, entering the the other side of the business which was in the factory which was the sort of manufacturing part of the steel business um, and I looked after that for a few years and then um, then I sort of was put into a role which oversaw all the projects that we did we had at the time so this is still in the steel construction days before we even had we had higher. Yeah, so, so maybe just to backtrack a little bit, just to catch the audience up. So our Fazzy Hire, let's just call it that, yeah. is a little bit different because there's a group of companies. So it didn't actually start out as a, as a hire business. Uh, do you want to talk about like, the original roots for our Fazzy? Sure, sure. Yeah, so 1980, uh, Avril Alfassi, the, the founder and um, CEO, he, he founded Alfassi Steel Construction. So basically just a steel fabricator, started in a small factory in Moorabbin. Um, I think his first work was like, he was, he was welding the, um, the sprinkler pipes that you see, you know, so steel, mm. little steel pipes. And eventually that, you know, grew into um, an, like we were the biggest steel construction company in Australia for a while. Um, yes, yeah, so that was, you know, and in 2000, 2002, we went to Asia and we, um, we did, lots of big jobs in, in Asia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. Uh, we went to the Middle East, Qatar, Dubai. So we were just a, a, a very large, well-known steel construction company. Um, and, you know, worked for all the T1 clients, um, all the major projects, you know, landmark landmark projects. Um, and that's, that's how we really started. Um, and higher... I mean, Hire came in in 2004. So, you know, if you look at our 42 years, it's only 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a newer part, but it's been around for a while now. We, start, we, we literally had our own gear to, for our steel erection. So mm -hmm. it, it started by us having bought scissor lift, boom lifts, cranes, so we could do our own steel erection. We didn't have to hire off, yeah. off, the, off the other guys. We were, you know, we didn't want to give them the money. So we, uh, we bought our own equipment. Um, and in between jobs, sometimes we had, we had this equipment sitting around in the yard. And so 
you know, and, and we had relationships obviously with the higher companies around the time and they said, oh, why don't you give it to us? We'll hire it out and we'll pay you some of it, like sub, what we call now sub hire or, you know. Um, and so they, you know, that was, um, that was how, that was really the start of the hire company because we, we saw the, that these hire companies were, um, had great clients, they were using our machines, mm. you know, making a ticket off us. And then we, um, we thought, oh, well, let's buy some more machines. We'll use it for our own steel erection. And in between, we can hire it out ourselves. Yeah. And that, that was the start of the whole wow, that's crazy hire. It? Yeah. It's, um, you sort of never know what's around the corner, do you? Like in that example where it's sitting on the job site and then opportunity to like do a sub hire or re rent to another mm. customer. And that turns fast forward to today, and now Fazzy is one of the largest hire companies in Australia. Mm. Yeah, it was. It, that's literally how it started. And we, and then we said, oh well, let's make a business out of it. So at first, our Fazzy steel construction was, you know, it was eighty percent of the revenue because mm. we were hiring it out internally, um, and then we'd hire out to some customers, um, and sub hire to the other hire companies. And then today, if we if we would go all the way till today. We don't have steel constructions anymore, so our fancy hire is, you know, its own business. A hundred percent of revenues from external clients. Yeah. Um, so you know, completely changed um, our business. I feel like a lot of construction companies are slowly moving towards that that model. I think uh, one of the larger ones is Select Plan Hire through. I think it's Langer Rock. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like like that's a completely separate business, and then like that's a massive company now as well. Mm. And that's that started out as as a company that wanted to manage their own fleet and then sort of grow. So I think more and more contractors are getting onto it, but obviously you were well before most of those companies uh, and you sort of started that. So it's, it's an interesting pivot, I guess, as yeah. well. Yeah, and I guess, and, and and we, and another pivot was, was you know, as steel construct, we decided that, you know, we wanted to start a property business. So, um, you know, we, we then focused, the focus moved away from the steel constructions into hire and then into property. And now today um, we are, you know, property business and a hire business. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's what we, that's how we are now. And I think when I got here, you said that you actually built the building we're in today that's right, as yeah. well. So you wanna talk a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, that was um, one of our uh, more recent developments. Um, we, we started this in 2019. Um, we you know we we bought the land we you know came up with the plans we got the permit and we built the building um using a using a construction company um it finished uh last year we got pc and then we um you know it's almost fully tenanted so it's been a very successful uh office building we we um you know, we got in at the right time in Cremorne. Cremorne now is in, considered to be one of, it's like Silicon Valley in Melbourne. Okay. Um, so a lot of the sort of tech companies and, you know, creatives, they're all coming in here. So, um, and we were one of the first, we were probably were the first you know, major office building in Cremorne. Um, so very popular. Um, and that really kicked off the property business, um, development business properly. It's, um, it's now, you know, we've now got another project in South Yarra, uh, with another office building, and we're um, undertaking another one in Church Street as well, just down the road. So wow. there'll be uh, there'll be an amazing precinct. Um, and so around the, the hire business, so obviously started off small, like what's the scale to the business today? So today we are, we've got about two and a half thousand pieces of equipment. Uh, majority um, access equipment, so you, you stand, you know, scissor lift, boom lifts, tele handlers, forklifts. We also have cranes. We've got about 40 cranes that we dry hire. Um, so that's a bit of a unique proposition that we have, where we, where we, um, some clients love to hire everything from us. So they got the cranes and they got the access equipment and you know, mm. one stop shop. Um, so yeah, two and a half thousand pieces of equipment. We're in Melbourne, Sydney. Brisbane, North Queensland, Hunter Valley, and uh, we just started in in Pilbara. Wow! Yeah, so. so something about your equipment stands out as well. The fact that it's white, it's very unique. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Yeah, well, we, um, you know, we, 
so the the our fasci has always been red the actual fasci which which comes from the steel construction days red and white um that was our logo and so we sort of thought well let's let's continue that branding um it's a well-known it's a well-known company in the construction market so um why not use that and um and i think something about white machines freshly painted we we make sure that you know they always look good and new i think something about that is fresh you know it's it's new it's um um hard to keep clean but i yeah, think it looks good it stands out i was talking to a hire company over in perth last week and all the machines are pink <laughs> it's like you can see it yeah. see it on the job site yeah it's right <laughs> Uh, but look, Sunbelt, same thing. All the green machines. Mm. I think Complant, they're like a limey green as well. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious when you're, you're on a job site and you're trying to find your machines to take off rent. That's right. <laughs> Where it is. Yeah. You won't confuse the, the boom lifts or sizzle lifts. Yeah. Uh, cool. So so maybe we'll go back to your your career then. So engineer, looking after all the, the, the projects. Like how did you sort of get to where you are today then? Uh, hard work. Um, no, look, in, in it, it was I spent a lot of time in the construction um, game, and uh, you know I looked after many projects, um, and you know th- I think through that eventually looking after more project, looking after m- more scope in the business, um, you know eventually was was the MD, um, and uh, you know that's just um, for me was natural progression it is a family business um some people will say oh you know you're 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 married to, into the family so you know that's that's uh that's how you got it but look uh, it's just um understanding the business i think um and um you know keeping your finger on the pulse and um business is business in in a way as well like you know whether whether we whether you do, you're a steel construction or you do property or you do hire i think um at the end of the day um you know if you have the right attitude the right smarts about you then you mm. can run you can run a business and then so each of the units have their own managing directors as well so yeah. how does that how is that set up yeah so um our fancy hire has a managing director Elard, and um and a gm gary and they look they and they run the business you know day to day they really you know um they really they lead that business you know and and i mean um the the um myself and the board um we we just really you know oversee we help we throw ideas we strategize um but Elad and Gary are really the the um the two key people in that business as well as obviously you know if all the, the whole team and um you know we have great people in the business uh we've now have about 120 people so it's it's certainly uh it's all about the people yeah and so it started out as a family business and it still is a privately owned family business yeah. so how mu- how important is that to our fazzy oh look you know um we Yes, we are family business, but we like to be. We like to operate as a, as a, um, you know, as a bigger business, if you like, or as a big business. We like to have, you know, all the, um, all the, whether it's procedures or whether it's, um, whether it's yeah, the setup of all the separate businesses. They're all, um, you know, operate as as if it is a, as public almost, um, yeah. but. You know, there's always that element of family business um, that makes its way into yeah, to the culture, various groups. Like, yeah. Like, so typically within family organisations, uh, like the culture is a big factor, mm. and I'm assuming that is a is a big factor for our Fazi as well. It is. It is 100%. Um, you know, like like people often say that people that work here often say they love how quickly things are done here. The decisions are made quickly. It's agile. Um, we can always speak to the boss and and um i think that's a nice it's a nice thing mm. and it's a, you know and, and it gives a it's a and everyone that works here feels like they're part of that family that's the sort of um that's what we love about it and uh um it's it really um i think that's a massive difference between us and a bigger organization yeah and so the the growth side to so being in so many different cities was that mostly organic or was that through acquisitions Oh, and it's all organic, all organic. Um, 
we, you know, I think high started 2004 in Melbourne, Sydney was 2010. Um, we just opened a branch, um, you know, f- from nothing. We opened a branch, got some people there um, and sent some machines from Melbourne, started the branch, you know, and then bought obviously more machines. Same in Brisbane, a year later, I think we we're in Brisbane, um, did the same thing. Um, and it's purely organic growth, just, you know, bought a lot of new machines every year. Uh, it was very important for us to keep the fleet young. Um, so we, you know, we just continued, continually bought machines, uh, different machines, you know, and so eventually we had the whole, um, we had the whole Eastern coast as well as all the offerings of, for, you know, any, any size machine, any type of machine. Yeah. And so you also have like a service arm to the business as well. So, uh, is that part of the, like, do you do all the servicing internally? Yeah, we do. Yeah. As much as we can, you know, um, we've got mechanics, service techs, on the road um, in every every branch every state um, I mentioned you know North Queensland now and, and Hunter Valley so we have that all covered um, it's it's you know it's like I said we've got 120 people and they're, they're running the business everything's done internally mm. and so let's talk about your equipment a little bit more so uh, we'll talk about the the clean equipment or the green equipment yeah um, but I, I did see the spider uh, lift. So, is that something that was something new that you brought into the market as well? Yeah, I think I, I think we were the first actually to bring the spider lifts in. We always try to stay ahead of the game, you know. Um, and that comes from our, I think it comes from our steel construction days where you, you know, we always try to be the leader, and we were eventually. And and it, the, the way you do that is by continuously improving, solving, and 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 staying ahead of the competition. At the end of the day, that's how businesses succeed. And um, you know, we've tried that in the high business as well. It's, um, you know, always trying to st- stay a step yeah. ahead. Look, eventually everyone catches up, but we were first to get the spider lifts and probably first to get the um, the, the 150 foot boom, I think it was, the, the biggest boom at the time. And um, uh, first to get the track machines um, as well, Omni, the Omni booms. Um, so we, we keep we keep pushing the boundaries and trying to stay ahead of the game. Yeah, so obviously it's, it's a risk being the first because you don't know how your customer is going to respond. You're the first user of the machine potentially in Australia. Like, is that just part of the innovation that you want to be seen as a market leader when it comes to the types of equipment and the innovation? It is, it is. We, um, we'll take the risk, you know. Um, it's an educated risk, you know. We do our research, do our, do our DD, due diligence. Um, you know, you don't want to do, you know, make, make silly, silly things, but you learn from mistakes as well. And so it's all part of the culture, but we, we need to, we feel like we always need to stay innovative ahead of the game, you know, whether it's technology or machines or types of products um, and the way we do things. Um, and so the electric machines is obviously becoming like the talk of the town. Mm. I was just over in Germany at Baumer and there's so much talk around um, electrifying various industries and types of equipment. And you can see it's slowly being adopted at, for at larger machines as well. So like, where are you sort of at that place at the moment with your electric machines? Yeah, well, we just, um, we, we um, first of all, I agree with you. I think that's the way of the future. I think, um, you know, you can see in every other industry, that's the talk of the town. And, you know, I think the higher industry is caught up now and, and that is, um, you know, we, we have to do that. We have to do that because that's it's for the planet and it's for, you know, it's for the future of, of everyone. But um, in terms of what we're doing, we're, um, yeah, we're, we've got some um, very large um, rough terrain, electric machines coming um, um, very soon. In fact, we've land, we landed one a few months ago um, for a trial. Um, it was 73 foot straight boom rough terrain boom um fully electric green machine no emissions so we sent it to um we sent it to a client um, of ours just as a trial to see what people would think about you know this electric machine it's a dingling machine um and so we sent it to them we taught them you know we taught them how to use it and not that it's you know it's not rocket science um and they loved it. They loved it. They loved the no, the zero emissions. Um, they loved that it had a four-day charge 
um, um, from from a full from being fully charged it gives you four days of uh, wow. you know typical use. Um, and they just didn't want to give it back. We said, listen, there's a trial machine. We need it back. We've got other people to try. And they said, no, we love it. Uh, double the rental we, rates. That's right. <laughs> we'll rent it from you. They said, we'll rent it from you. Don't worry. And, um, and eventually we got it back and we sent it to others and everyone, you know, just everyone that, that's, that's used it, loved it. They say it's got the same functionality as the diesel machine, um, you know, and it's just zero emissions. And they just, you know, the whole business... All these business and these are tier one, you know, contractors. Um, they have their targets to meet as well, and they just, you know, they just um, they just want they they really need this machine to for the zero emissions. Mm. So I guess there's a lot of people out there that question uh, the ability to actually run electric machines on job sites, and like you just crushed one of them just then by saying a full day gave them four days of operating time, which is mm. an amazing mm. outcome. So. Is there any other things that you've seen as like misconceptions around the electric machines? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the biggest question is always um, charging. You know, how do we, you know, how which we just which we just sort of spoke about. There are also other products. There are they're coming to the market. I must say, they're saying by the end of the year, um, but soon, which are um, um, sort of power packs, which which basically you can fully charge them separately, send them to site. And then they'll give you the charge. They store. They store the the mm. the, the, the storage um, unit. But they can also plug straight into the to the power. So, and then they're, they're used as a multiple charging station. Um, there's fast chargers which are available, which we have. So, fast chargers means you know, fully charge in two hours. So you don't have to charge it overnight. So full charge in two hours, and then you got those four days again. Mm. I think mean, so. That's that's sort of probably one misconception. There's still look. There will still be learnings, and I think speaking to some of the clients, the sites themselves will be set up in the future for charging electric machines, and they'll set up their sites so that it will make it easier, and they'll have the facilities there. Um, and the other one is purely, I think, the the capa- the capacity, the functionality. And and we've proven, I think, in these trials that um, they're just as the capabilities as per a diesel machine, a mm. rough terrain diesel machine. The power is there, um, the functionality is there. No emissions, no noise. Yeah, and so correct me if I'm wrong. You're also the first company in Australia to bring in the rough terrain on that size electric machine as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe so. Look, I, um, we're certainly one of the first, um, and. We're going to have um, hundreds of those machines coming um, in the next few months, so um, we'll certainly be, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a very large fleet of these electric machines available very soon. And so that's probably one of the challenges that the industry has at the moment. There's probably people listening to this podcast saying, "Oh, we're doing that, but it's not coming for another two years." <laughs> so yeah. supply. So you've managed to somehow figure out how you can get these machines from. You said Dingling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was that something that you've been working on for a long time or is it because you spoke about it oh, so long ago and, and placed the order? Like, how did you make sure that you got the equipment uh, so quickly? Yeah, look, we, we um, I mean, I remember we visited Dingley's factory, I think it was 2019 um, or 2018. We, we actually went to their factory um, and that, it, the electric machines weren't part of that range at that time. But we could see that, um, you know, there was... They were, you know, very good factory. They were, they were thinking about electric. They were quite advanced um, in their ways, and um, you know. But at the time, we sort of we sort of left it, and then, you know, fast forward few after you know, fast forward what three or four years, um, they've certainly um, been able to build really good electric machines um, that we're comfortable with, and we yeah we stru- we, we we signed an agreement with them earlier this year um, and we've got the supply coming in and um, they I think their lead time is pretty good considering the delays that we've seen yeah around the market and so do you see over the next few years like your fleet almost becoming mostly electric or like what does the future look like in the next like five years do you think yeah it's a good question um, I, I think that um, that it certainly, uh, it won't be. It won't all be electric yeah. because you know there'll be sites that just they can't use them. Um, 
So it definitely won't be all electric, but I think that the the tide will, will shift and we'll see a, a, ma- a majority of the equipment being electric. Mm. I wonder if the rates for diesel will start going up yeah. and then the lower rates for electrics and like almost like punishing people mm. for using those types of machines. Yeah. Probably the other way as well, potentially. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how the market responds yeah. as well. Well, hopefully the rates will uh, increase for both. That'd be best <laughs> yeah. for the hire industry. I, I was... Um, Talking about rental rates, so uh, I gave you the podcast with, with Greg Parfit mm. at, at Orange Hire and he was talking when, I think it was the early 90s, he was getting the same rate for a 19-foot scissor on a weekly rate back then that is that is this industry standard today as well, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah? That's crazy. I, I, I heard that. I couldn't believe it. I think it was the sa- I think it was getting the, a daily rate, which is yeah. the same as a weekly rate now, mm. which is just unbelievable and... Yeah. It's, it's to change look you know I think um, it became a commodity um, obviously 90 foot scissors is a commodity but a lot of a lot of access equipment has just become a commodity that you have to have and you know there a lot of higher companies started um, and and, uh, and uh, you know are around and so obviously that drove the prices down um, just general economics but uh, I think we're seeing a shift, which is good. I think that um, you know, I think if you're if if I think customers are starting to understand, although there they can you can look at it as a commodity, but you can also look at the service. You can look at uh, you know your um, you know the 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 age of the equipment, um, and I think that um, clients appreciate now um, more than ever that. Um, you know that you've got good machines, service machines. They won't break down, um, and if they're getting good customer service, they're starting to you know pay a bit more for the machine. Mm, Probably the, not enough, but just a bit more. Yeah, but like the thing is, there's, there's so many factors here. One, the cost of the machines is going up, so the OEMs are putting a mm. 10, 20 percent increase on on that, but that doesn't change the rental rate. And then the rental rate doesn't pay for the machine. The rental rate pays for the business to operate. And so, like, it, yeah. there, there needs to be some where... Because the way I always look at it, like, how can something like a chainsaw be the same rental rate as a scissor lift? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. And, I, yeah, it is crazy. And that's just... That's the industry. And, and I think... Slowly, slowly, um, you know, we're just educating the customers about, you know, what they should be paying for these yeah. machines. But I think the industry, it's not just the customers, I think the yeah. industry as a whole, because if you put your prices up and mm. then someone else decides, oh, this is an opportunity, it's like petrol. Mm. You know, mm. Everyone puts their prices up yeah. and then one petrol station goes lower, <laughs> everyone goes to that <laughs> petrol station. So the industry as a whole needs to figure out how we can work together to slowly start increasing the prices because eventually what happens is people sign up to these crazy terms of of finance agreements and then they can't pay off their mm, equipment mm. and they can't pay their staff and then so that it's the small companies that get burnt yeah some like you guys i think you'll be all right because you're, you're big enough yeah. to sort of sustain but it's the small like the single branch mm. small operators they're the ones that really get screwed yeah. so yeah, yeah. No, i think you're right the industry needs to you know needs to sort of like I said, it's it's educating the customers, but also you know not not sort of going um, silly on rates because at the end of the day, like you said, um, you won't be around you know if you do that. So there's a there's always a there's a fine balance. Yeah, and it's like with any business though, there's always that fine balance. Yeah. So let's talk about your involvement with the Hire and Rental Industry Association. Uh, are you involved with them at any point? Yeah, yeah, we're involved. We're involved. Um, we the the, the uh, most recent involvement is with the um, Women in Hire program that they have that they run, which is excellent. Um, they, you know, obviously it's all about promoting women in industry, but also helping them, training them um, to become leaders. The new, the, you know, our next leaders, um, and we have four women. Um, that I think two from Victoria, one from New South Wales and one from Queensland. Um, they have started the program this year. Um, and, you know, and it's something that we strongly, as a company, we strongly believe in, in, in 
you know, obviously equality for women, but also we're trying to promote women in the industry. We come, you know, again, we come from the construction industry where, you know, in 1980, there were very, very, very few women um, in the industry. Obviously that's, that's improved, but there's still a long way to go. And we're, you know, we're um, big promoters of that. Mm. And I think we'll talk on the phone about a story about an individual within a fuzzy uh, that started like in the wash bay or she, yeah what was she was a, yeah yeah um Denise, she was a yardie yardie in, Sid, in the sydney branch and um she was actually german um backpacker you know i would say um and she you know that was her f- just a job that she was doing um to earn some money f- you know just to, to be able to live and continue traveling but eventually um well, first of all, she loved it. She loved, she just loved being yardy. She loved being out there. She was washing machines. She was, you know, helping the mechanics. She was just doing anything. Um, um, and, you know, she loved it. And you could see, you could see, we could see how uh, motivated she was um, and how intelligent she was as well. And she, I, I can't remember what she, what she, what degree she had from, um, from the German university, but she's got a degree and, and, so we, we spoke to her and we said, look, you know, why don't you, um, you know, come, you know, work full time, um, stay in Sydney, come into the office and, and, you know, start training her on the other aspects of the business, um, which she was very happy with. And today she's um, New South Wales sales manager. Wow. What so story. it's amazing. And, you know, she's, she's great at her job and she's... Um, you know, she, the good thing is, is she, we've kept her in Sydney. She's not traveling anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very lucky to have her. Amazing story. And then I think we'll talk on the phone about uh, an employee assistance program yeah. as well. So, so what is that? Oh, so we, yeah, we implemented that this year as well. Um, that's a program where the, um, the organization that we're using provides support and assistance outside in, in a confidential basis by professional um, counsellors or psychologists for people that experience any kind of mental health issues. Um, you know, mental health is a, is, is a big issue, as we all know, um, and we're trying, to, we're trying to talk about it. You know, in our business is trying to talk about it more than ever. Um, and sometimes, you know, people, although, you know, we might, we might advocate to exercise or to, uh, you know, enjoy friends and family and as, as a mental health um, as, as to improve your mental health, sometimes some people just need that additional someone to speak to, yeah. uh, and and we thought that was really important to provide that to staff. Um, you know, it's it's and 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 you know the good thing is that now we're talking just by doing that we're talking about it more. It's not a, it's not something that we want to that people should be hiding. If mm. they if they've got an issue, you know, talk about it and. Um, we're all here, you know, we're all here. We all understand we're all here to help. Yeah, I feel like obviously time's evolving, but so many people just bottle stuff up. They come to work and they seem like they're happy and then stuff's going on in their life. They don't know what to do or they're stressed. And mm. then the tiny little thing at work that might seem like nothing, like, I don't know, someone wipes off the whiteboard because mm. they had something written there and then they just snap. Snap, yeah. And so being able to like, support people and make sure because you don't you never know what someone's going mm. through mm. so th- that's the goal of this program essentially to try and just provide an extra means to assist them with their mental health if that's they, right if they require that's it. right and you know because you can do a lot of things to improve mental health um you know and but this is additional you know additional something that you know is with, with a professional out of line and um you know they're going to help you through the, the tough times you're experiencing one of the other things we do is volunteering. We do a lot of volunteering as a business, um, as as with teams, um, with with you know different branches. That's also very good for mental health. Um, I think people that haven't done it should do it. You know, it's amazing. Um, you know, what one when we when we do a volunteering session as a group, to watch the people do it and and coming out of there, I can see everyone is smiling. Everyone's happier. Everyone feels. Um, good about themselves and good, mm. good about what they've done, and I think that's you know that's such an important um, part of our culture. Um, you know and that comes from again from the forty years that we've been we've been volunteering, we've been philanthropic. We you know support lots of charities. It's um, it's 
just part of our DNA. Mm. Yeah, I feel like, like obviously it's amazing giving back to those charities, but then the, the team bonding that comes out of doing that together as well, it's very hard to put like a price on that because mm. you, you're now going to learn more about your colleagues and whatnot, and then you build up that extra layer of like connection, yeah, essentially, which you... Unfortunately, so many people come to work and they, they do their job and then they, they know mm. Barry across the hall, but then they don't really know mm. who Barry is. That's right. And then you go out and you're like, oh, Barry likes golf or Barry <laughs> likes whatever it is. And then you build that connection. Mm. Um, so just being able to encourage people to do that. And and I think it's important for like the senior leaders to like be um, at the head of the pack, like uh, the forefront of doing those sort of things as well. Don't just tell staff to do That's it. Right. Be there doing it with them. Yeah, and we do. We all, we're always there. Um, you know, whether it's every uh, uh, founder and, and CEO, myself, all senior management, we all, we all do it. We all get involved um, and and do it regularly as well because it's easy to sort of put it off because it was too busy. But I think it's something that um, um, in terms of, you know, a feel good and start even for staff retention you know everyone talks about staff retention and um how hard it is these days well I, you know that's one of the things that i think we do well um and it's it's things like volunteering it's things like you know um you know having town halls and weekly get-togethers and social activities and you know it's all important um for staff retention mm, yeah no, that's good all right, look, I want to learn a little bit more about you as well. So we've spoken about Afazi as a lot. So who do you think has played a big influence on you from a mentor perspective over your career so far? Um, look, I, I think probably I have to say Avery Alfasi. Um, I've worked alongside him for over 20 years. Um, you know, he's the ultimate entrepreneur. Um, he's He's... And he's instilled a lot of the good culture that I think we have in this um, in the business. Instilled it in myself, but uh, in in you know, in the business in the business culture. Um, you know, he's got grit. He's got, um, but he's you know always honest and transparent, and and he's got amazing integrity. And he's built such a successful business, and he's still so and he's, and he's very humble. And so I I I think I learn a lot from that. I think that um, that's so important. Um, if you're going to become, if you're going to be a leader, to me that is sort of the ultimate um, combination of mm. of characteristics. Yeah, so and then and then working with him 20 years ago and working today, like, what, what was he like 20 years ago? What's he like today? He's certainly mellow, mellowed out today. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, 20 you know 20 years ago he was still was still building, he was still you know building the business and um, putting Alfasi on the on the uh, putting our his name you know out there and um he, uh, yeah definitely uh mellowed out but you can still uh hear him um in the office occasionally <laughs> um obviously always saying nice things yeah um but yeah no he's, he's he's been very you know and it also keeps things fun as well i think it's also important you know keep things fun we we, we love to you know um have a laugh and joke around as well so it's it's just as important mm. um I, and i think my other the other mentor which is um thinking about the question is uh my wife you know she brings another aspect which is you know she shows the the she shows she's very passionate about whatever she chooses to do and i think that i love seeing that and that sort of helped me um be passionate about certain things and also bring the human side of things you know she she can um it's very easy as you run businesses to um look at everything from a from numbers or from spreadsheets and from you know what has to happen mm. but sometimes you know you got to step back and look at the human side of things look at the um emotions and it, it, it helps you in business so that's that's sort of um I think um, been great for me yeah. to spend twenty something years with her as well. Wow, <laughs> that's a very, very strong yeah, relationship. That's then. right. So, something I want to like touch on is obviously over that twenty year period, you probably went through like a few challenges as well, like our Fazio as a group, and then you personally as well over your career. Like, 
So what do you think were some of the key challenges that you faced over the last 20 years? Oh yeah, there's, there's many. Um, you know, in the construction game is obviously difficult and you know, um, it's, uh, we did a lot of major projects and you know, complicated, um, iconic projects that, um, you know, took a lot of, a lot of um, in depth. You know, you had to get into the detail. Everything you couldn't, you couldn't. You sort of every day was another issue, another problem on site. You know, we had, we had thousands of of people of employees, um, and and there were challenges. But I think um, I think that um, one one of our values is is the company values has sort of been there, which is always you know stick to the end it's always um no matter no matter what the challenges are no matter how hard it is um we, we always stay to the end we always finish projects we always mm. um you know solve the issues so um i think that's a important value that that we have and it's passed on to the higher business because you know we're whatever challenges we have you know we always look at it and say well what's the opportunity out of it and how do we solve it and um you know, I think that's why we're also on all, you know, the high businesses on all the major projects around the country. Um, a lot of, t you know, a lot of our clients are tier one uh, contractors. And that, that comes from the construction days, you know, mm. it's sort of like, um, you know, it, it comes from knowing how to deal with major projects, how to deal with tier one clients, how to uh, make sure that um, we solve all this solve the clients issues yeah and then i think when we're in the other room in the building you're talking about the challenge of of putting up like building this building and then COVID happened yeah. and then working with partners and whatnot and then but you said something during that was like it was like a really challenging period and it was just like every day was a new day and you're like yeah. all right how am i going to attack this like yeah can you talk through that a little bit sure i was hoping you wouldn't bring up COVID, but we we brought it up <laughs> so we've got to talk about it um yeah, look, we this building, um, like I said, started in 2019, and um, as we all know, late 2019, you know, early 2020, um, you know, the pandemic hit, and we we you know we had issues on the project, um, and because you know everyone everyone panicked and no one wanted to build offices, and you couldn't talk to any potential tenants to fill your office building because everyone was at home so who's going to look for new office uh you know offices at that time um you know finance was an issue so yeah it's it's literally you know looking at day day in day out just addressing the problem and it's solving you know solving one problem at a time because you know you otherwise you can get overwhelmed you might have there might be a hundred things to resolve but you got to sort of break it down and you know you get through it and and that's again what i said about um, not giving up and staying to the end that is the grit that we have in our fasi that's um it's it's like i said instilled from from the top down through our business mm. and so when things do get really hard like how do you manage your stress like what do you do to bring yourself back down to the ground zero um i'm i'm a pretty calm guy but uh you know look there's always yeah like you know there's always that that stress um in those times i think it's just about um spending time with family um you know and friends because you you know there's there's you've always got support from them um but i think it's important also to you know um have a bit of r and r in between and that's that's very good for so uh and it's very good for you know um helping you through the stressful times mm. yeah it's it's an interesting one because I feel like stress is one of those things where if you don't address it and you just keep grinding and grinding and grinding, like it's just another one of those mental health things where it mm. wears you down. So um, it's interesting, like when you said you're, uh, like your personality is calm, mm. I think that's a, it's probably a trait of a lot of leaders. Like when the storm's on and the fire's on and everything's like challenging and hard, then you've got this leader wherever it is it, it seems like nothing's wrong mm. like they're the one that is just like trying to keep everyone it, it's all right guys like we'll yeah. figure it out we're together whereas if a leader is 
also saying, oh my God, business is going to be shut down, yeah. like this, that, uh, yeah. like it just, it almost like sets off panic. Yeah. So is that something that you learn over time about being calm or is that just who you are, do you think? like? What? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think um, I've always been sort of a calm person and, uh, you know, nothing, nothing overwhelmed me to, you know, to any degree, but but you do learn that over time you know um i'm sure i had some sleepless nights uh, occasionally still do but lost lost a lot of hair <laughs> think about um, this podcast or <laughs> yeah that's right um but i think yeah you do learn that you do learn that over time you know that you if you put your head to it and if you you know think about things calmly and if you you know take one thing at a time as i said you resolve it and um and that that if you learn that i think that sort of helps you deal with the situations mm. as you mentioned and then so if you could go back in 20 years and maybe give some advice to yourself or maybe other leaders that are sort of trying to work through positions like what advice would you give to them um stick it out as you know and that, that we just gave that example but i think um you know some people uh, you know they they they'll maybe the younger generation they sort of um they don't like something so they sort of move on and move on and i think that my advice would be you know give it a go you know give it a go as long as you you know you're enjoying yourself or to a degree you just give it a go and stick stick at it and see where that takes you um i mean other advice i would give is um make sure you enjoy yourself at work as well you know like, like we talked about mental health we talked about you know coming in and just putting your head down and doing your work and then going home and and that's not what that's not what life's about you know we live once and work we spend a lot of time at work so you you want you got to enjoy what you're doing um and probably another piece of advice i would give is um try always to create a win-win situation you know that's that's something good that i think leaders should you know should future leaders should sort of learn um it's not about if if it's a win-lose so if i you know if i do something if i talk to you and you know we're having some kind of argument or we're you know trying to solve something and i and i win and you lose that's not going to work in the long run so um always try to um look for a win-win yeah. is something that I give, like Give a to little do. sometimes. Yeah, give a little sometimes. And, you know, bo both parties need to sort of, um, and that's, you know, that could be at home, it could be at work, it can be in your, just generally in your life, I think it's a, mm. it's a good attitude to have. And I think in that win-win, it's identifying maybe who aren't good partners mm. or customers or contractors. Like knowing yeah. that they, they're always trying to make you lose. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There is such things as bad customers. Absolutely. So it's, it's identifying those things as well. Absolutely. I think, you know, and and to be honest, you know, with people and, and you know, transparent. So that sort of all, all comes in. And if you've got someone on the other side that's not, um, that's not, doesn't have your values or those values, I think you need to sometimes, you know, move on and mm. look elsewhere. Yeah, definitely. All right. And finally, so how do you define success? Look, success to me is, um, there's a few things there. I think one is achieving your goals. Um, it can be um, achieving your life goals. It can be achieving your work goals. But I think that setting setting goals um, and and achieving them is sort of really important in life. And that, that's sort of, to me, a big um, mark of success. The other one is, I think, learning from mistakes. And hopefully only, only making them once. Mm -hmm. I always say to my people, you know, it's okay, you made a mistake, let's learn from it, but don't do it, don't do it again. I think that's sort of success as well because you, you, you have to make mistakes um, and we all do, but it's learning from them and not repeating them. That, that is success. Um, so I think that's the sort of what I would uh, define as success. Yeah, like it's, it's never going to be like a... A clear road you, you gotta if you want to try and take risks on or do new things like you're gonna screw it up eventually it's just about making sure that those mistakes aren't big enough that are gonna affect other things so 
it's uh it, it's part of mentorship like you mm. you if you if you don't put yourself out there or jump in the ocean or whatever the the metaphor is like you'll, you'll always be trapped in your little box so it, it's part of growth yeah no it's uh that's you know like yeah it's very important and um obviously yeah you don't want to make a massive mistake because that could uh cause issues but yeah i think if you do make a mistake you need to have the ability to own the mistake mm. as well mm. like if you hide what you've done wrong like most people don't care if you made a mistake you're like oh i broke the tv in the boardroom <laughs> and you don't say anything it's like all right well what happened accidentally i bumped it like yeah but if you don't tell someone yeah and then you hide it like that puts a very bad light sure in that person yeah so little things where i think um yeah, I think just making sure that you understand that there's always going to be hardship as time goes mm. on, whether it be on a customer side or internally or equipment or whatever it is, and just knowing that it's like all part of the journey that you're sort of going through. Yeah, and that's why I said before, honesty is so important and integrity, you know, um, and that that's part of it is to, um, you know, yeah, if you've made a mistake or if you don't know something or not, put up your hand, talk through it, um, and there's always going to be a solution. And so, um, you know, we have a, we have a, as part of our induction for new employees, we have um, obviously induction booklet, which every company has, and it's got all the policies and procedures, the standard ones, but we've got a little section at the front, which is our FASI um, learnings, if you like. And it's it's put together, you know, over from, from 40 years of experience in business. Um, and it applies to anyone, It's it, whether you're in the hire industry, or whether it's a construction or property, it's this fundamental things that we try to instill in people that will make them succeed, but also will, um, we believe is so, you know, so important, um, in any business. And so those are some of the things that, um, that, that we spend time with new people and, and try to, you know, instill that into them. Yeah, that's good. I like it. All right, Gil. Well, thank you for coming on the rental journal podcast. Thanks very much, Mark. 